Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks for joining us today for this video. I think we we really appreciate you taking out the time and sharing more insights about what Lestari Capital is doing and in the blended finance space and also sharing more insights about your design funding experience and journey with us and, and the audience looking at this video. Uh, why don't we get started first? Uh, you know, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself and, and also share a bit more about Lestari Capital? You know, what do you, what, what are you all doing? Uh, the background there and what's the mission value objectives of Lestari Capital? So Lestari Capital um, uh, started about six years ago in 2017. Um, but actually the idea for Lestari Capital started uh, much earlier than that. Um, what we do is we work in uh, nature markets, um, innovate, innovating around actually structuring that market, um, working very closely with clients to build the mechanisms and the business cases um, for them to invest in nature and climate-based solutions. Um, and so we are, one of our flagship programs, um, which is the RIMBA Collective, actually started really as an idea. Um, and just to give you an example about how, how, how this works, um, we started with a, with an idea saying, you know, the palm oil industry has really difficult um, challenges um, around sustainability. Now, a lot of those challenges are actually becoming more and more clear, um, tend to focus around the fact that they are heavily dependent on, on land use. And so you have challenges around no deforestation, you have challenges about scope three emissions, you have challenges um, around actually protecting sites and protecting uh, the supply chains and um, not cutting out suppliers and working with suppliers into, into transforming the supply chain towards that sustainability. Um, and a lot of those um, challenges can actually be responded to, you know, through financing, supporting um, nature-based solutions on the ground. And those can take many different forms. And so we worked um, with our four founding partners um, within the RIMBA Collective to really better understand uh, you know, what their business case is in terms of what they need, what is it, what are the outcomes, what are the impacts that you actually require. And then we structured the mechanism around that to be able to raise the financing from, from the demand side, manage the financing, um, and then deploy the financing um, to portfolios um, of projects. And we also work um, on those portfolios of projects. So those are um, these are third party projects um, that we finance, but we build the portfolios. We work on the due diligence. We originate the projects. Um, we onboard those projects into the project portfolio. We provide the MRV services and, and effectively what we're doing is we're financing these these projects in a portfolio in an aggregated way um, to uh, effectively source the impacts um, that they generate and the impacts um, are numerous uh, whether it's biodiversity or conservation or restoration or livelihood impacts uh, or climate focused impacts and those impacts that are then verified they are put into a registry go towards um, the the um, fulfillment of the corporate sustainability commitments that they have and those again could be quite varied in terms of how those impacts um, are, are utilized and so you could say that what we do is we build nature credit mechanisms um, that are able to actually source and deliver nature credits um, to, to support the fulfillment of corporate sustainability commitments uh, on the ground. And we, we do this in a, in a number of ways. And so we as a company um, are actually innovating now around uh, sourcing scope three emission um, outcomes. We work on carbon credits um, as well. We support certain companies in compliance with, uh, with specific standards. So there is a wide variety um, uh, that, that we do. But, you know, one of the most exciting things is really innovating new mechanisms um, and trying to actually build the market um, that will then support conservation and restoration into the future. Talking about nature credits a bit and how it links up to, you know, the work that you're doing on this on on this proposed new solution for the nature crediting vehicle uh, and and uh, a blended finance mechanism around it. You know, I think it'd be interesting for us to understand, you know, what what is the objective and what comes next after that in terms of this new solution, uh, which is focused on blended finance and nature credits. Yes, I mean, what we're looking to do is really build on the experience um, that we have from the RIMBA Collective and working with the palm oil sector to bring this 
um, solution to the fashion industry and, and specifically the garment sector. And the reason is, is that there, I mean, there are many similarities, by the way, between, you know, any sector that is actually dependent on, on land intensive commodities. Um, however, they are all facing, what, what they have in common is that they are all facing multiple demands. Uh, some of them are still emerging, uh, but some of them already exist. And those could be both from, you know, uh, voluntary commitments, such as science-based targets uh, for nature or SBTI around climate, um, they could be no deforestation commitments and so on. Um, but then they are also more, more importantly, I think, emerging regulatory demands on these companies. Um, and those might be things like the, the EU developments um, under the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. Um, you know, so under these, actually, companies will have to start identifying what their footprint is um, and then actually reporting that publicly. Now, of course, companies will then be seeking, well, what can we actually do about this? How can we go through that journey where we, um, of course, identify what the impact is, but we avoid future impact, we minimize um, the existing impact, we rehabilitate, um, but then there will always be a residual impact. So how do we address that, that remaining footprint? And so there are, effect these are effectively two buckets of insetting and offsetting. Um, and I think, you know, I firmly believe that, uh, that nature credits can play a really important part in actually supporting companies in being able to credibly demonstrate that they are achieving uh, that, that they are moving through that journey and achieving the targets that they, that they have committed to, uh, or that they will be actually un, 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 in many ways, unfortunately, being forced uh, to, to commit to at a, at a later stage. And so, you know, what a lot of these commitments have in common, as I, as I mentioned before, is that it is, there is a focus around um, in needs for interventions um, on the ground. So you require to be financing interventions, whether they are, you know, removing uh, or, or mitigating uh, carbon um, emissions to whether they are actually supporting projects that avoid further deforestation in your higher deforestation risk areas in your sourcing regions. Um, so you proactively protect your supply chain um, rather than rather than be reactive, which is really no longer acceptable, um, not only under voluntary, but also regulatory commitments. Um, but then actually, how do you positively contribute to the world? And that is, I think, where we see this, you know, no net loss and no uh, and net positive kind of gains and nature positive. There's a, there's a lot of um, terminology that, that's around it, but it really what this means is that how does the corporate world actually uh, contribute uh, towards the world, to contribute towards conservation and restoration and livelihoods in a positive way. And so this mechanism that, um, that we hope to conceptualize, that we're doing the feasibility assessment um, for um, under, this, under this grant is really focused on that. And the fashion industry is fascinating. They are much earlier stage um, than many other industries. Um, they have similar issues um, that they are facing that they need to address. But in many ways, there are also different challenges around traceability to, to, the, to the field, um, around certain commitments and level of commitments that they have, and biodiversity, pollution impacts, and so on. And so what we're going to be doing here um, is not only identifying, you know, what is what does the industry actually need, um, but then how can it actually achieve um, those, those needs and, and the targets that they will be making. Can you shed more light just on the importance of having a blended me blended finance mechanism here? Uh, why is it important? What how can that help to help to sort of mobilize these corporate commitments and and sort of help support you know projects on the ground to to create nature credits and achieve the intended impact outcomes? So I think if you if, if you're actually looking to make an impact um, and work and develop a, a new market um, and also you know work within a new new sector, um, it is important that 
you know, many sort of traditional investors uh, and many different financiers probably would not be supporting such early stage market development. And I think that is really where blended finance plays a, plays a key role. It catalyzes, um, you know, movement towards um, actually structuring the market better, being able to demonstrate that there is viability um, within within the sector, that the mechanisms can function and that they, that they can actually deliver the impacts that, that, that you need. It also actually signals to the corporates that not only is there interest from, you know, then ultimately potentially investors, but that there is a general kind of consensus on the direction that actually the sector should be taking. And I think that's really important because there is a lot of fragmentation. Um, there are a lot of different initiatives which which sort of look around this sort of biodiversity credit, nature credit, um, and you know, even carbon credits in many ways, um, space that, you know, the corporates start to actually see OK, maybe this is the pathway um, that we can actually achieve our goals and our sustainability um, credibly um, and, and we can demonstrate that and, and actually, you know, our our actions are going to be taken in a, in a, in a way which is which is positive rather than, you know, being accused of um, of you know, greenwashing. And, and unfortunately, it's still um, an issue. So, you know, blended finance provides that catalyst um, towards actually the market maturing, um, structuring, um, but it also provides the finance that then allows you know, other investors um, to be basically coming into this space and saying, ah, this can actually work. This is an investable model. Um, and therefore, you know, they hopefully will then take that take that forward. And I think we I, I think we already see examples of that. But you know, we, when we're working in these really emerging markets, um, you know, that blended finance catalyst is still really necessary. Got it, got it. No, thanks, Michael. And, and, and we can appreciate that. We've seen that across currently, especially in the nature-based solutions sectors, uh, you know, relying on blended finance mechanisms, especially, you know, a lot of the times just being a nascent sector and when you talk about emerging markets to be able to really build out, uh, you know, credibility or investability of a vehicle rather you need sort of some concessional layer and that's what we've seen across from other grantees as well from their experiences uh, which seems to ring true for you know this, this innovative concept around nature credits uh, and 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 you know maybe maybe we can talk a bit around uh, you know we, we discussed about you know uh, you know the mechanism that you're working on and 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 the importance of having a blended finance structure around it uh, Maybe let's talk about you know the, the 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 design funding grant that you be you got through the feasibility study. How could that be important? And in in sort of setting up this structure, and what are the, some of the key elements that you're looking to achieve through the design funding uh, that you've received to to sort of help build out the initial pieces of this uh, this this structure around nature credits. So this is really my my sort of favorite part, um, and so I get you know I get quite excited about this because you, you're effectively starting with with with, a, with an idea, with, you know, with a, with a concept, with a you know kind of um, slight apprehension. Okay, are we going into this? You know, are we too early? Are we not too early? You know, what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? What are the risks that we're going to be facing? Which is exactly you know as going back to the the earlier question, exactly where blended finance you know is the catalyst uh, towards being able to explore some of these things. Um, but you know what we're going to be doing is we're we're starting with a, with a sort of the general concept of what we would like to achieve, um, which is sort of replication of the similar model of collective action and collective aggregated sourcing at scale um, of nature outcomes that then go to to, to fulfil the the corporate sustainability commitments. Um, but specifically under this window, you know we're going to be number one um, looking at you know what is the what is the level of demand. What type would what, what type uh, does that demand actually take? Um, and that means, you know, what are the outcomes that the corporates actually within this sector require in order to achieve their sort of sector specific goals? There's a lot of overlap with other sectors, as I said, but there are also sector specific um, goals that they will that they will need to achieve. And of course, given the, the the difference and the complexity of the supply chains within the fashion sector, those types of um, issues are going to be different, and and the challenges. Are 
going to be different. And that's you know really kind of where where I get excited about this. Now, once you identify that, um, we will be looking at well, what is the project supply? What types of projects are actually out there that can then address that that need, the the, the sustainability commitments um, and the demand, and and can they do this credibly? Is there enough scale? Um, and you know, how are these projects um, uh, going to be sourced? Um, but also, what stage of development are these projects? You know, are, is there going to be further financing potentially needed to then kind of, you know, springboard catalyze that part of the um, of the industry? And so we're going to be actually scoping our pipeline uh, of projects um, moving forward, depending on what the type of demand is. We believe that actually the pipeline does exist um, and sort of early um, early assessments have, have sort of shown us that and we have good experience already in Southeast Asia to show that the, that the scale is there. Um, but different projects obviously have different challenges and so that's also important to um, address. And then they will be looking at the, the shape of the mechanism. So how can you actually link those two aspects, the demand and the supply? What does the mechanism actually look like that can then deliver the financing uh, to the ground and then source the outcomes uh, that are resulting from those projects? Um, and that will require looking at you know, legal structuring, financial structuring, governance and operational structuring, um, MRV systems and so on and so on. And so you know, really exciting, I think, piece of work, which is effectively starting a new market for the for the fashion industry. You've successfully gone through this cycle, the design funding cycle and and would be would be really interesting to hear your insights in terms of uh, you know, what are some of the critical aspects that other prospective applicants who are looking to apply for design funding or, or another other other folks who are looking at designing these solutions should be mindful of when they're applying for programs like these? Sure. Um, yeah, very happy to. I, you know, I'm I'm a very firm believer in um, in having very open and honest discussions. And I think, you know, our relationship, um, I think, you know, and, and the journey that we we sort of took together, um, which lasted a fair few months, so we had a good chance to actually get to know each other, um, is to be very open and, and honest about, it, well, exactly what we feel that the challenges are um, and, and working through those um, with you. And so because actually this kind of early stage work um, in a in an evolving market, as we you know, as we keep saying, um, you know, there are challenges, there are unknowns, um, there are risks, but there are also fantastic opportunities. You know, and that's I think that sort of level of excitement around that, which which I believe was 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 quite joined. Um, you know, is I think what really you know helped us in the in the in the design of the um, of the of the grant proposal, um, and so you know I think. You know, my advice, I think, to any prospective um, grantees would would really be that, right, is to, is to actually talk about the risks and the challenges um, that you foresee, as well as the opportunities, right? I mean, I think we all see the opportunities, but actually, you know, the sector doesn't tend to learn from its mistakes as well. And I think that's almost as important as the, you know, being able to actually see the opportunities and you know coming to the table and very openly discussing them um because that actually then allows us to design the 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 study and the work and the and the year ahead much better together because we understand each other's expectations we understand where the challenges might come and we understand what is and what isn't feasible in that window and i think that actually is what makes for a good application no great great points michael and and, and we agree and i think we we, we tell up prospective applicants often as well. Uh, obviously, it's important to scope out the opportunity and the scale and what the value add is. But of course, some of the critical risks and challenges, uh, you know, get overlooked or are shared pretty high level. Again, obviously, it's important we, we do understand we're trying to support innovative solutions and also very early stage. So there are also a lot of inherent risks that come with that and 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 we any which ways would factor into our evaluation but it's important for us whether the applicant also has assessed those and how what is their plan forward and if they're well prepared mm -hmm. to, to you know mitigate or take mitigant steps to against those risks as well and that helps us build more confidence as well in in potential applicants uh, in potential applications as they go through the process so so great great points michael 
uh, and and maybe just the last question now uh, is is in terms of you know any other aspects like you mentioned around risks. Uh, is are there any other critical aspects within a proposal that you know applicants should be mindful of, or maybe through the design funding experience process itself that will help you know prospective applicants really stand out? I think on our side the. Um, you know, the really thing, the, the really kind of important things that made us stand out, um, I believe, is the fact that we, we you know, we, we've done this before. Um, and so that we have actually, you know, gone from, from this conceptualization uh, to the design, to the building, to the operationalizing um, of these vehicles in the, in the past. Now, I understand that that might not, you know, always be the, the same for all of your applicants. Some might not actually um, be presenting something that you know is is to be replicated. Um, but I think it is important to be then able to actually demonstrate. Okay, but these models can work, and you know if they have tried and, and they failed, understanding. Okay, well, why did these models fail in the in the in the past? And so being, I think, being able to talk about that and being able to sort of say, okay, well, this is how we would address those risks um, that 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 those previous models um, have had I think would be would be really helpful I think also you know we're very lucky to have um, you know we're almost 40 people um, now within the starry capital and we have a very multidisciplinary team you know we have a legal team we have a finance team we have we have very heavily um, uh, uh, experienced project team um, and that I think is, is you know I think that sort of makes us stand out specifically is that you know there are a lot of um, there are a lot of companies um, you know outside of outside of Asia or outside of the ground I should say or outside of the field level um, that have good ideas um, but unfortunately you know unless you actually have the field level experience of what it takes to actually be able to deliver these projects on the ground deliver the conservation and the restoration on the ground um, it's um, you know, it's it's a much higher risk, I think, proposition. And so actually having that expertise in the team, um, you know, really, really, uh, really counts for something. And and I think, you know, that is also actually why our corporate clients trust us uh, is because, you know, we go to the field, we understand the, the, the challenges that are there to deliver conservation and restoration and so on. Um, and that's what differentiates us, I think. Um, so those two things, but again, I think I do think it comes back down to, to to being able to identify what the challenges are and talk about the risks and and you know really be thoughtful around how you plan to address those. Um, you know, not every risk can be mitigated, right? I mean, that's just a, it's just a fact of of, of these kind of early stage um, uh, developments. Um, but you can show that you're at least thinking about it. You know, kind of. Um, smartly, if that's uh, if that's a way to to think about it.